<laughs> so my name is Joshua Jensen. I've been working at Target for about two years as an interactive development architect. Um, I also work at a local startup named Kittison uh, as the lead developer there uh, for web. Um, and both of those uh, organizations, I've been using Grunt for at least a year um, to just kind of make my life easier um, in taking care of the menial tasks and tedious things that you might be stuck doing um, during your development process. For example, minification of files, compiling your SAS files, um, transferring files to an FTP server constantly. Um, instead of doing these things manually, you can get things set up automatically with Grunt. And it's really easy to get going, and you really don't even have to know JavaScript to do it. Um, although it is all JavaScript. <laughs> So there are plenty of packages out there that already exist um, that you can leverage to do just about anything. So if there's a task that you need to complete, you can pretty much Google it, add the name Grunt next to it, and you'll find a plugin. And if not, maybe you could make it. <laughs> um, so what I thought we'd do first is kind of, kind of walk through how you just get started up and running really quick with Grunt. And I've created an example repository on GitHub if uh, you'd like to follow along or play with the files that I'm going to be working with. Um, this is just a short link to get there. Um, so, let's get started. First, we're going to look at what a grunt file consists of, or what you need to actually run grunt. And there are two things um, that you need in your project. First, you need uh, a grunt file JS and this package JSON. And in order to get these, um, you can generate the package JSON from NPM. So if you're familiar with Node.js and the Node Package Manager, um, this is kind of old hat to you then. Uh, pretty much any fi uh, project that has a package JSON is leveraging the NPM network. So um, I'll just actually show a quick example of setting up a new package JSON file. So if I test um, if I just run npm init, uh, it's going to take me through the steps of creating a new package JSON file. So first, that's what I want to name it. I'm just going to name it test. Most of these configuration options don't matter um, just for setting up the project. Uh, version, we'll do 0.0.1. Um, description, a test grunt build. Well, you'll see what's going to happen in a second. Most of these fields will just be empty as they're just configuration options that if you were going to publish this to NPM, um, this is uh, what people would search by, how people would find your uh, package. So now if we check out, we've got it uh, just created that package JSON file. And if we take a look at that, it's going to have all that information that we just put in there. So. At this point, we haven't included any packages yet, any NPMs. So uh, our first step is going to be to choose what plugin do we want to include, what task are we trying to run, what are we trying to accomplish with Grunt. And some of the most common uh, modules that are used uh, can be found in the Grunt plugins uh, website. They have over 3,000 different plugins. And these top four or five or 10 are uh, insanely popular and pretty much every project that I've been involved in uses these. So um, let's start with just adding uh, this watch task um, into our project. And so how we do that is using npm uh, we're going to npm install uh, save dev. What this does is actually puts a reference to this npm package into that package JSON file that we just created. Um, so that way, if you commit this file to your project and another developer pulls down the package JSON file and they run npm install, they're going to get the same plugin that you're installing right now. So this is like a map of all the dependencies um, for your project. Um, I should probably save dev. Uh, grunt contrib watch. And so that's going to go out to NPM and grab that uh, package for us. And now if we look at our package JSON file, you'll see that uh, right here 
and our dev dependencies. Uh, both the grunt has been added as a, def as a dependency for this grunt contrib watch that we added. So uh, now when we save that file, uh, if we push it to our source control, which we're using git, and someone else pulled the file, ran npm install, obviously they would, they would get this uh, plugin. So, all right, so now let's say we went through and we got the other, some of these other packages so that we want, we're gonna need the, the watch task and um, SAS um, so that we can edit our SAS files and then watch that file and automatically compile it into CSS. So set up this task. Um, I'll go into that uh, project that I'd already created. Um, here's the URL again if you didn't already grab it. Um, if you're interested. And so here's what my package JSON file looks like now. After going through that process that I just went through for the watch plugin, I also did it for the clean, concat, sass, and uglify. So I've included these five plugins in my project, and now I'm ready to get set up and going with Grunt. So I want to figure out now how to, uh, how can I configure these tasks, how can I actually run them and make them do anything useful. So. In order to configure all of that, uh, we're going to create a file called gruntfile.js. And you could also use CoffeeScript if uh, you're keen to that sort of thing. Um, but here's just basic JavaScript. Um, the grunt file consists of four main parts. Uh, this first function here is this uh, grunt init config wrapper. And this is basically defines your configuration for your grunt file. And within here, you're going to configure all of your different plugins. So here you'll see we have a watch task, SAS, concat, etc. So this is where we're going to override the default configuration for any of these plugins that we've pulled down off NPM. Um, the next part is we're going to tell our grunt file where we can actually find these plugins. So we're just going to say hey, NPM load this task. And since it was just pulled into our project into this node modules directory, um, it's, it's looking here to reference each of these plugins. And then right below that, we're going to define our custom tasks. And so this is where we actually define what our grunt tasks are. So um, if we're going to run, run a task like grunt uh, build or grunt uglify, um, this is where we're going to define uh, those kind of tasks. So the first thing we're setting up is our default task, which will run um, automatically if you just run uh, grunt in the console. So, for example, um, oops, so you get that. So if I just run grunt here, you'll see that it started running watch. And so what running grunt did is it just went right to this default task, it said, I'm going to use this watch task, and the watch task is configured um, right here. So let's take a look at the configuration of the watch task and what that's actually doing. Um, so the point of the watch task is for you to provide it some kind of configuration for a file path, and watch is going to look at that file, and anytime it changes, it's going to then fire another task. So in this case, we're going to watch are source CSS files. So over here on the left, I've got the, the project uh, hierarchy. And if we drill down into CSS and source, we'll see this main SCSS file, which is a SAS file. Um, all I have in here right now is one um, CSS rule, uh, just for example. Um, and any time that we would change this file now, since that watch task is running, um, what Grunt is going to do is it's going to say, hey, there's a change made to a file within this directory. So you see this wildcard here that says any file within source. Any file that changes within source, we're going to fire this task, SAS. So a change is detected, and we're going to fire this task, SAS. So let's look at what SAS is doing. And if you're not familiar with SAS, um, it's a CSS extension which uh, allows you to use uh, variables, mix-ins. It basically adds a much more um, robust feel to uh, CSS. You can do a lot more with it. 
Um, but the one caveat is every time you make a change, you need to compile it into actual CSS in order for the browser to be able to use it. So we're setting up this test so as to easily interface with SAS and generate our CSS um, without manually having to do that every time. Um, again, so anyways, uh, into the SAS task. Uh, when this fires, we're going to um, look in that source directory where our SAS, the source SAS file, and we're going to generate a CSS file into this destination uh, location. So if we look here in CSS generated, we have a main CSS. And here I'll just actually delete this file so we can watch it happen. Um, if I make a change to the SCSS file and I save it, we just saw this main CSS file get automatically generated um, since this uh, task was watching that file. So I can do it again. We could change it back and we will see that the task has run again. So bare bones, that's a simple way to just set up, get SAS running on your project really quickly um, and have it generate that CSS to another file um, that then you would reference in uh, like your index.html. So I just pulled, uh, this index.html is a demo from Foundation, so it's like the Foundation Frameworks boilerplate index file. And so we can just take a look at that. So I added in that debug CSS class, I compiled it and added it to the project. And that's referenced right here. So. Okay. Um, okay, so great, we got CSS compiling from our SAS files. Um, maybe now we want to deal with um, minifying our CSS and concatenating our files and automatically minifying all of our JavaScript and combining it into a package. Um, you can get that set up really quick too with just a few more plugins um, called Concat for concatenation, uh, Uglyfy, which is Uglyfy.js, which basically goes through and like simplifies all your variables and uh, minifies your JavaScript. And then this other clean task is something that we're going to use for um, cleaning out our generated directories. So all these files that are compiled, we're going to, we don't want to save them in our project. We're going to use them, we're going to deploy them, but we're not going to commit them. So we want to make sure that we clean out these generated directories so as they don't get confused with our source files. So, take a look at this first task, um, concatenation. So what we're doing here is fairly similar to what we were just doing with the SAS file in that we're pointing to the directory um, where our CSS file lives. And in this case, it is that generated uh, main CSS file. And I'm also including the foundation uh, framework in this concatenation process, and I'm just going to combine those. And that's really a personal preference if you feel that you're going to only want to make one HTTP request and combine all these into one file. Um, you can gain a little bit of performance out of that. Otherwise, keeping them separate is just fine as well. Um, but it's super easy to configure in the task. If you change your mind um, later, you could compile these to two separate um, files. Um, but in this example, we're going to compile both of these into one main min CSS. And for the JavaScript, we're going to uh, go into our public JS directory, uh, as you can see over here. And we're going to say anything, this wildcard here, anything in this folder with any name uh, that ends in JavaScript is going to get included in this task and, and uh, generated into this vendor.concat. Uh, Actually, I'm going to rename that. Uh, package uh, package concat. So this will be a concatenated file of all of our JavaScript files that are included in our project. All right, and so once that task has been configured and we're, we're happy with that, we have our concatenated files, now we're going to uglify them um, so as to reduce their file size. And 
first we will just run this concatenation task by itself so you can see what that does. Delete these ones that are already generated. I suppose I could actually just run clean the task that I've set up, right? <laughs> So now the generated directory is gone. Um, so if I run grunt concat, and then I need to pick a subtask here because I have two configurations defined for concat, this concat task. I have CSS and JavaScript. And so the first one I'm going to run here is the CSS task, and we'll see what that outputs. Um, concat CSS. So that's referencing concat and CSS in our grunt file. And here it's telling us that it's generated that CSS file. And we'll take a look at that. And here's all of our CSS concatenated into one super long line. And that's all we're going to need to do with the CSS. We don't need to uglify the CSS. Um, that's as minified as it's going to get. So the next task that we'll run then is the concatenate the JavaScript. So if we look at what JavaScript files we actually have to concatenate, um, right now we just have a vendor file full of some typical vendor libraries you would include if you're making like a backbone application. So <clears throat> we want to combine all these into a package, um, which I had defined earlier as vendor package, but we're just going to call it package. Um, right now. So um, let's run this concatenate JavaScript task. And our file was created. And let's take a look at that. And this one's going to look a little different because um, it's just all of those JavaScript files just back to back here concatenated. So now we want to take this file and make it as small as we possibly can before deploying it to um, our application server. So in order to do that, we're going to run this uglify script, or task, sorry. <laughs> this uglify task is configured um, by pointing at our destination file that we're going to end up with, so our package minified JS. This is the one JavaScript file that we'll have to deploy. And we want to create this file from that concatenated file that we just generated in the previous task, which we can dynamically um, link to by using the, the syntax within the grunt file, uh, concat uh, JS dest. So if you look here, we're accessing it right through um, this this uh, JSON object essentially in this grunt uh, function wrapper. So concat JS destination is going to output uh, this file path for us. So in, we could just put this here, but then at some point, if maybe we change this and forget to change this, then it's just a management headache. So it makes sense to just dynamically link to this path um, within this task. So if we run the uglify task, and I believe it was called package. Is that yeah, so you, you could do that. So right in here, this first variable here called package is reading in a file called package.json. Um, and we could reference this variable throughout um, throughout this file and variables defined within that JSON file. So if I wanted to reference, say we look at this package JSON, I want to reference something within this object, within this grunt file, I could say uh, package um, pkg, for example, pkg.name, that's going to output uh, this the name from our file. So if we want to dynamically reference anything within other files, you can read them into the grunt file and kind of traverse through them in this uh, simple dot notation. 
So let's take a look at that uglified file. It's going to be much smaller and it's all <coughs> compacted into a nice small package. And so you'll, still, you'll see that we still have our old concatenated file as well as our minified. And if we look at both of these and we compare the size, we see that the unminified concatenated file is much larger um, than the uglified version that is super minified. So obviously we want to use, leverage that as much as we can um, to squeeze any performance that we might gain out of the couple hundred kilobytes there. Is that the code that does the augmentation and minification? That's all the files all the scrub tabs that you installed right now? Oh yeah, so here all the, yeah, everything that's running there is within this node modules directory. So when we install a, like a node package, it's going to install that specific plugin within the node, node modules directory and basically use this and its default tasks um, that are defined within this code. And so all of this code is maintained obviously by whoever developed this package. I don't ever really, I don't want to go in here and change anything because this is going to be something that's, uh, I'm constantly updating or pulling the latest version of. So. But those are already adopted as well, right? Yes, okay. yes. That, that much too much in IO and stuff Yep, it's, it's doing all that uh, itself. So you, some of these node packages even have dependencies on other uh, node modules. So, for example, when I installed that very first Grunt, uh, Grunt Watch uh, plugin, um, you saw that it added grunt as a dependency because that package had a, depend a dependency. So sometimes if you install a plugin, you'll see like three or four other NPMs get added to your package JSON file, and that's because they are leveraging other packages to do what they need to do. So, all right. So, so we've got our uglified file. Um, we still have this concatenated one in here and our CSS is fully minified. So I think what we want to do now is clean out this extra file and then just maybe combine all these tasks to run automatically. And I've already defined that as a task called build. So down here at the bottom of the file, typically by convention, um, you can register as many tasks as you want, kind of combining um, other tasks that you've already configured um, above in the grunt file. So. Uh, you'll notice this build task that I've created. The first thing it's going to do is run clean build. And clean build <clears throat> is going to look at this generated folder and it's going to just remove it. So that's the first thing we're going to do in this task is we're going to make sure that the generated directory is just gone because we're going to now create the files that we want um, to be in that directory. And the next thing we're going to do is we're going to run the SAS task which is going to compile our CSS and ensure that that main, uh, right here, this uh, main CSS file exists. So you don't want to concatenate it when it's not generated yet. Um, and then after that, we're going to concatenate our JavaScript files uh, to prepare that for the uglify package task. And then after the uglify package task completes, we're going to run clean concat and clean concat is going to look at that same dynamic path to that concatenation JS destination and it's going to essentially remove that file because we don't we don't need it anymore. So if we run that grunt build, it's going to run all those tasks together in the order that we defined and we'll end up with our minified CSS and our minified package JS. Um, and those are just like really common useful tasks and the next step from there is you could add in a task um, for deploying to a server. So let's say you have uh, SFTP access to some static server or only FTP access either way or you're using an Amazon S3 server or something like that. Um, you could say, okay, I need to find a plugin that's going to help me do that. Um, the easiest thing to do is just uh, Google it. <laughs> Look for uh, a grunt plugin that, uh, let's say, what would I say, S3? There's a, a, a couple of them here for just adding files to an S3 server. So instead of having to use some graphical user interface client that's kind of clunky and tedious, um, you can do it right from the command line and configure it once with grunt 
and then just hit one button and put all your files where they need to be. Um, and so I can show you an example of that. Let's see, where am I? Oh, that's a grunt. It's uh, another grunt. Um, so here uh, at Target, we're using a coffee script file for our grunt task uh, file. So you notice the syntax is a little different, but it's essentially just compiles into JavaScript. And so it's uh, the same exact thing, just without uh, curly braces, essentially. <laughs> So we've defined uh, an SFTP deploy task um, that will go to different places depending on what we're trying to do. Um, and basically what it does is you pick a directory to, de to uh, take all your files from, and you pick a directory to put all the files to, and then you press run and it works. <laughs> Obviously, you need some configuration, for example, your username and password or public key authentication. There's all kinds of configuration options that uh, you can uh, configure and see how to use them by basically going to the page of the plugin. And there's usually a nice example of a working configuration. So you can essentially use this and cater it to whatever you need. Um, in, uh, in your project. So I'll show you an example of um, deploying some static JSON files to a server. Um, so I'm going to run grunt sftp deploy um, and then I have a task oops, called Temp JSON, which was uh, kind of a band-aid fix. I just needed to get JSON into a server quick, and it was easier to do it this way because it took me two minutes to set up this task. Uh, temp JSON, deploy that, and it's going to log in with my public key, and it's going to error because I for <laughs> forgot to exclude the .ds store, so I want to do that. Um, and then it pushed all these files out to the server for me, and I'm already done. I've just SFTP'd about 20 files instead of having to open up uh, some kind of uh, uh, FileZilla or CyberDuck and like drag them over or however you're going to do it. Um, it's just a really quick way to hook that up to where you need to go. So that's one other practical use. Um, another thing that we're using Grunt for uh, at Target is actually creating uh, an icon font. So if you're familiar with, let's see if I can Google Ico Moon. Um, icon fonts are essentially a font that's filled with um, SVG icons that you can use on your website as handy little icons. <laughs> Instead of having multitude of uh, image files or ginormous image sprites, uh, you can manage these scalable vector graphics within a font file and the support, the browser support for it is uh, fairly wide and it's really easy to implement fallbacks for browsers and devices that don't support um, custom fonts. So we are using that, here let me turn it up, is it three, four. So, Essentially, we have a bunch of different SVG icons um, that you would get from a designer or make them yourself if you're ambitious. I'll open one of these examples. <clears throat> and what we want to do is we want to use this vector graphic and make it into an icon. We could export a PNG, we could try to create some kind of sprite and then create CSS around it to like map its position perfectly, but then you have to worry about doing the like at 2x retina version for every image, so you end up with either two sprite sheets or two versions of the image. And with the icon font, uh, it's going to look good at any resolution uh, because it's based in SVG and not pixels or raster. Um, and you can also generate 
those PNGs or JPEG images automatically using a grunt task for the fallbacks for the few browsers that don't support uh, font face. And so we've set up a task that will uh, go through and take all of these SVG files and turn them into uh, the font files that we need, which that doesn't matter, but <laughs> these are the files here. Um, four different font formats that are supported across the web and the CSS that goes along with each of those icons generated automatically. So, let's see. I was just you're hosting them by Right, so we're hosting them ourselves. So uh, originally when we started using font icons, we were using the IcoMoon tool each time to manually go back in and like add an SVG icon and then export it from IcoMoon. And it's a really tedious process and it's a hard thing to kind of explain to people coming on or like p designers that aren't familiar with the process and it's much easier to give someone a template and say put an icon in here and give it back to me and I can just drop it in this folder and be done with it. <laughs> so um, we eventually developed this process uh, using Grunt <laughs> um, which does just that. So you'll see we have a plethora of icons in here and not only do we want to get these into the uh, font file but we want to generate the CSS automatically um, that, posi uh, that references that icon and replaces the correct character. Because how an icon font works is that instead of, um, you know, say you typed the letter F, we could replace that character with like uh, a target logo, right? Uh, and we're going to map that um, here by detecting the character code and uh, over over overriding it with our custom font, which is nav. And just to show you the end result quick, it's right here. So these icons up here are all using the icon font. So you see the span with the class of uh, icon target. It's a uh, double namespaced. Yeah. <laughs> um, and right down here, you'll see that all the spans in our app header have a font family of icon. And a font family of icon is, we're not going to be able to see it in the inspector, but we have uh, defined um, an at font face class of um, icon, and it's referencing these generated font files. And then we've also included this CSS which is, you'll see it namespaced by some feature detection logic here. So we're also using Modernizer to determine whether or not font face is available. So um, the parent class needs to have uh, both font face and loaded, which means that our font files have, are loaded and actually are available. When both of those classes are true, uh, then we'll see the font icons display. So that's what that namespacing is doing. And so essentially we'll take this CSS, we'll pop it in to our uh, application code, and we'll be able to use these uh, icons. And we also have the fallbacks um, that basically if like font face isn't there, and there's actually, I think, uh, so then you see these, like a fallback image. Looks like one's missing. Oops. Um, so here is one of the fallback images. Fallback sprite, actually. So this is what you'd see on like an Android 2.3 device. Um, or if for some reason you tried to access the mobile target site through Internet Explorer 7 or something like that. <laughs> so. <clears throat> All right, and let's see, I'll run that task just so you can see it working. So let's generate. So the task, again, let's see what it's, what is it called? If we look in our grunt file, which is another CoffeeScript file. 
we have a task called icons that runs web font. And so web font, this task here, is going to look through that whole directory of source SVGs and it's going to generate fonts to this destination path that we've defined here. And then there's some other additional configuration options which I'm sure we got straight from the web fonts uh, plugin page. So if we, again, in order to figure out these configuration options, we would just uh, look it up here. And here it's going to give us all the information that we need and an example. And so essentially, taking that base configuration, um, we've added onto it to do all the things that we need it to do. Um, for example, we're passing in configuration to generate four different file types, because um, we want them all. And we're also defining a CSS template. Um, let's see, that would be SVG font template. So. <clears throat> This template is what's generating that CSS, so it's going to look through each of those um, icons that we're generating, and it's going to take their file name and add that to a CSS rule, and then also add them to this bottom CSS rule. Uh, so you see this output come from that. So each file, a new uh, a new property here, and each one gets added here, then they all inherit this uh, font family nav, etc. All right, and I'll run that icons task. Done without errors. All right, and that just whipped out a couple new the new uh, fonts, and we have actually a. HTML file that gets generated that just proves that it's working. So here we're referencing those paths that we just exported with the CSS that we just exported, and we're making sure that they all show up here. And they do. So, alright. So, I mean, those are some uh, more complex tasks for fairly specific um, needs. Um, but you can pretty much uh, make any grunt task do something very specific for your project. So if there's something you find yourself doing even twice, it may, it may very well be worth it to look into creating a grunt task for it because uh, pulling something from the NPM network and adding a couple lines of configuration um, can really save you a lot of time and effort um, throughout your development process. So let's see, I don't know if you guys have any specific questions or is there any part that might need more explanation? I mean, feel free to ask, yeah. Um, I was just wondering when you have to compile all the JavaScript, yeah. do you use source maps then to debug it or do you switch between um, having it like inject source references to unidentified files or something? Yeah, you definitely could. Um, so in this base task, I really didn't set up anything like that. I just kind of assumed I knew what the path was going to be. But you could have some kind of like path variable based on like your environment that you would basically inject into like your view or something. So instead of it being you know, local host for your local development, you would compile all of it in the base path for uh, your file would be like, for example, here, TGT files, etc. Um, so you can definitely pass in configuration um, to any task that you're running. Um, and even with that Uglyfy task, um, you don't necessarily need to... Let me go back to it. Uh, you don't need to replace all of your variables um, with you know cryptic ones like ABC. That's what it's going to do with default, but you can leave it expanded so as if like there are you know, functions that you want to be able to test in the console or something. Um, you don't need to minify it as much as Uglify does by default. So there's other configuration options that you can pass in um, to uh, most of these tasks. And it's really if, if there is a task that's doing something that you don't want it to do or you don't feel like you have enough control, the easiest thing to do is to just uh, snipe it off NPM, pull it down by yourself, and make some changes to it, and um, 
push it back up as something else. Make a few changes to it, edit it how you need it, and uh, kind of just make your own like test version. So I've done that with the web font um, NPM module myself, um, just because we needed it to do some extra things, uh, like generate those backup um, sprite sheets. So. When you, uh, let's do the notification. Yeah. Uh, if you want to specify, I mean, sometimes you need JavaScript files to load them in a certain order. Sure. And so if you wanted to do that, you'd have to list them all statically in that files list rather than just using that wild card. Right, right. So you have to list them in order. You sure. Them in yeah, yeah. Otherwise, it doesn't just kind of do it randomly or intuitively. You know, I really don't know. I'm. Th I think that it was just taking. It would just go through by index of the file. So, um, but I would say you'd probably want to specify it. You know, explicitly if that's something that really matters. <laughs> um, so I just use a wildcard kind of as an example of different ways that you could reference these paths. So, um, for example, the CSS one. I would probably use a wildcard here rather than with the <laughs> the JavaScript because it's uh, at this point the CSS. Uh, doesn't matter. Do you usually, uh, is it more typical for your workflow to have most of your tasks in a watch tasks and just watch all the different files that you might be editing and kind of just do things spray in the background? Or do you find yourself more running the main with this it just day to day? Like oh, yeah, day to day. I'm usually, I usually wa use the watch task for just CSS. Oh, okay. um, and for my JavaScript files, like you don't really need to compile those, so saving and reloading, it's the same, right? So um, really I'll be explicitly firing tasks. So if we look at the, this is like our main, the project that I'm working on, this is the, the main grunt, grunt file. And we have ones that are basically for deployment. So we have like our default task that uh, updates our configuration, which injects the correct path for whatever environment that we're working in. Um, and then it's going to start our local node server. And then it's going to uh, fire SAS just to compile it the first time because we don't commit our generated SAS files. Um, and then we're going to fire the watch task. And then it's going to fire open, which essentially just opens our project in the browser. So that's like the main task that you'll use every day. Um, and then beyond that, we have some of our deployment tasks, which kind of run through different paths depending on what environment we're deploying to or what exactly our needs are for the specific um, deployment. So, uh, for a t little, little testing project, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's, uh, it's fun. So, yeah, uh, the main things, CSS, compiling from SAS, and uh, deployments, it's great for that, so. Uh, yes, so actually this, uh, this proto task, uh, stands for prototype, um, <clears throat> allows us to um, configure uh, an iteration on a file. So uh, when we're deploying, it will uh, either automatically increment from the, the last one that we deployed, or we can define a totally new namespace or iteration for it. Um, and another way that we handle iteration is with uh, timestamps. So we also have uh, this uh, configuration file, which basically this task here, SFTP deploy config, deploys our, our run JSON file, which essentially is, I'll show you what this looks like. It's just a JSON file with a timestamp. And so when we deploy uh, a new version of our application, typically for testing, this isn't a production thing at all. This is just we're rapidly testing. We need to get a new build out there. We'll deploy a timestamp. And this configuration file will be updated with the latest timestamp. So then um, whatever um, nodes that are already set up pointing to that uh, directory will reference this JSON file and say, hey, let's get this latest timestamp and load the project from the latest iteration. That way, we also don't have to go update you know, all these other files that are referencing maybe a static endpoint on a server or something like that. Um, so there's definitely multiple ways that you can do uh, versioning with deployments. Um, 
let's see. And yeah, if you are looking to get started and you're still a little confused, just go into gruntjs.com is probably the easiest thing you can do. Um, getting started, it's like a three-step process. All you need is to have Node.js installed, uh, run this npm install uh, grunt CLI, which will globally install the uh, grunt command line interface, and then you're good to go. So yeah. A lot of times, the technology's homepage isn't exactly the best as far as giving best tips and stuff like that. Do you think that their help resources are good? Or do you have any good talks or good uh, other sites for, you know, just, I mean, like what you're doing here today is not 101 stuff. It's like any cool things you can do with them. Anything else like that? What do you do? Um, actually, when I started with Grunt, I started here, and their their documentation here is uh, fairly extensive for just getting you up and running, and there's a fairly solid community around supporting Grunt and the various plugins here. <coughs> yep, there <laughs> you go, community tabs. Yeah, this is a good site. There's actually a blog post that I had found uh, that was also really helpful. I wish I had bookmarked it. It was like 12 devs. Oh, here it is. Um, so these guys did a fairly comprehensive job of uh, another quick start guide um, for um, getting going with Grunt. And they also have some things at the bottom here about other cool things that you can do with Grunt. Um, do more with Grunt. Do more with Grunt. And so, well, there's one we kind of talked about, the SAS. Um, yeah, I mean, honestly, the, the Grunt website does a pretty good do job on uh, beginner documentation. And beyond that, you know, Google's always your friend. <laughs> and there's always uh, tons of resources out there. Um, Anything else? Is that is that helpful? Did anyone? <laughs> right. <laughs> Come to mascot is so messy. You should like. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, some I know. Like, so I was like, we should use other grunts. So I just picked a bunch of different video game yeah, grunts. That was my favorite grunt. <laughs> oh, there it is. <laughs> All right. You just need to sub copy a characterized version of Toolbars. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> cool. All right. Well, thank you.